Hello, good morning to those of you in California in the smoky air. I hope you're inside and have some good filters. And afternoon and evening to those in Europe, we're very happy to have you here. And for those who didn't make it, uh, hello to the future. My name is Victoria Vesna. I direct the Art Science Center at UCLA. And I'm so excited about this panel that actually came together very organically. So I'm not going to take too much time because we'll have a fascinating discussion about the healing possibilities of space art in times of crisis, which we are in. So many people ask the question, why do we go to Mars now when there's so much suffering? And we're going to try to address that. Why are we going to Mars? Why are we putting all these resources into space research? How do artists have to play a role in this and scientists and writers? And so we're joined by Elizabeth Latore, who is a creative technologist in the studio at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, she uses design thinking methods and techniques to imagine the future of technology in space. Welcome, Elizabeth. And then we have Rhiannon Catalyst, who I have the pleasure to collaborate with on Alien Stardust, which we will present here on Sunday. Uh, she is a wonderful Renaissance woman who produces uh, and plays and sings, and she's worked a lot with NASA-powered immersive experience called Bella Gaia, um, created by Kenji Williams to stimu simulate the overview effect and inspire mm -hmm. stewardship. Then we have Daniel Wilner, who is the writer-director for film, TV, and theater. He graduated from Harvard and Oxford, and he is a practitioner of Zen Buddhism. The first time we met to discuss this session, he was actually in a Buddhist retreat, which was amazing. And then finally, Lindy Elkins Tanton, who is the lead of NASA Psyche Mission, Journey to a Metallic World, and she's also managing director of the Interplanetary Initiative at ASU. Uh, where they're thinking of a positive future uh, of humans in space. And she's also a co-founder of Beagle Learning, and her mission is to create a new generation of problem solvers. So this wonderful group here was actually brought together through me uh, contacting Tracy Drain, uh, who I met when she came to UCLA and gave a talk and just inspired and awed all of us in many different levels. Uh, Tracy is um, a lead system engineer now. She just got promoted to for the Europa Clipper mission. And that's why she's not here. She's probably <laughs> very, very busy working on some space uh, issues. And actually, Elizabeth, you know a little bit about, uh, and Lindy, I'm sorry, Lindy, you know a little bit about what she's doing because she was, uh, she moved from the NASA Psyche mission, right? That's right. She was our deputy systems engineer. Um, she's so good and she really deserves her own team to lead. And we, we miss her dearly, but of course we'll still be in touch and she'll still give us advice and from time to time. But on Europa Clipper, that mission, I think, um, in, it embodies a lot of the things we're talking about today. It's, it's incredibly ambitious. Uh, the, the radiation on the moon of Europa is so strong that if a person stands there unshielded, they would die within eight minutes from radiation damage. Uh, and yet we are so audacious that we can create a robot that can go there and measure and see if perhaps there's habitability or we hope in the future someday to discover whether there might actually be microbes or life underneath the icy shell of Europa. And so isn't that in a way um, just the microcosm of what we're talking about here? Why do we explore in space? Because it takes us out of ourselves and gives us the vision of what we can create uh, separately and together and what the positive future of humankind could be. How amazing. So thank you, Tracy, when you finally get a chance to watch <laughs> this. We totally appreciate you and you're yeah. breaking every single stereotype of scientist that is out there. I much appreciate it. Uh, so Dan, why don't you tell us how you met Tracy and how she inspired 
your work. Yeah, so so um, it's interesting, uh, you know, that she's now on the Europa Clipper mission um, to, to study, you know, a, a, an icy moon with a liquid ocean underneath its surface layer of ice because um, wow. that, that may or may not have microbial life or some other form of life that we can't currently conceive of because the, the reason that I first connected with her through a wonderful organization called the Science and Entertainment Exchange um, that she's a very active part of is because I'm currently um, developing a, a television show pilot um, around the first human mission to the outer solar system and uh, to study just one of these moons, not Europa, another one called Enceladus, which is a small icy moon uh, of Saturn. And I just think that there's something really um, provocative about thinking about these um, these um, moons like like Europa and, and Enceladus and Titan, and there's a number of others, because I, I think it really takes us out of ourselves and, and our our sense of the immediate present and and our sense of our immediate understanding. Because what uh, astrobiologists certainly you know talk about is you know one of the great great challenges of their discipline is say, you know, we're going to go to Europa and we're going to send, you know, some sort of submersible robots down into that liquid ocean to, to look for life. And one of the great questions is, you know, how do we, not how do we look for life, but how do we look for life as we don't know it? How do we, how do we look for, say, biosignatures that our existing biology might not have, you know, uh, any real understanding of and, and way for us to even see it? So, for instance, in the in the history of biology, there's a whole branch in the tree of life called archaea that that biologists used to just kind of um, think were just bacteria, and eventually they realized, oh no, this is a completely different um, whole branch of life, a whole different expression of life. Mm. We didn't have a sufficiently textured or nuanced or developed understanding yet to really um, see that. So it was it was staring us in the face. It was right in front of us, but but we were just kind of confused or our existing science was too limited. So I, I think there's something really powerful about, about this search for life, um, which, you know, my supposition based on my kind of research is it's not going to be, you know, little green men and women. Um, there might be some characteristics of life that we're familiar with, but there might be others that we're really not. And, and we might miss it for a while. In fact, there are even great, science fiction novels that, that presuppose that, you know, entire uh, bodies of, of pla you know, plasma in space could have consciousness of some sort and could be a life form. So I think there's just something about this idea of the search for life that really then brings us back to questions about ourselves and our own life and what's, what we are capable of and our own sort of limitless possibilities. And I think that's one of the, for me, one of the really healing elements of, of sort of film or other art uh, that, that sort of explores space and space exploration. It really takes us out of our immediate sense mm -hmm. of ourselves. And I think as we confront the crises of our day, I think what we need is the, is the capacity to, um, to get beyond a very limited, narrow, pessimistic sense of human nature, human capacity, um, in order to say we really can do anything, we can transcend, limitate that. What what life is fundamentally uh, on some spiritual level is the capacity to transcend limitation, to mm. transcend finality, to transcend form, to transcend even our ideas of ourselves, which are always too small for who and what we really are. And so that I think is one of the things that space and and um, space art can can do and can offer us. And so. Cool. Uh, you know, I'd love to hear more from my colleagues about, you know, whether that is something that resonates for them in their work. Rihanna, do you want to say something to that? I, well, I couldn't agree more um, with Dan and that, that way that this takes us out of the immediacy and the, the limitations of how we often are thinking of ourselves as being enclosed within. And I think also that one of the most important reasons that we need to travel to space, both physically and virtually, artistically and in our imaginations is, and how space art is deeply healing is not only what reminding us of what we can achieve and inspire 
by working together on these vast scales, working across nations, governments, across cultures, across generations. Um, but we also can realize looking out at the vastness and beauty of what we're all part of and see the potential for different futures. It also has made us look back at ourselves and completely shift our perspective on our own planet, our own place within the universe, and see our, our own planet as this amazing bubble of life, this very fragile and irreplaceable bubble of life in the vast blackness of space that is full of all kinds of life I think we're just beginning to, to discover as well. Um, but to see how this, this incredible, beautiful sphere is without borders, it is a whole. And by going out and seeing that perspective, you know, when William Anders took the Earthrise image in 1968, that changed our collective consciousness and perspective of ourselves forever. We saw for the first time how we are all part of this whole. And, you know, that was, that came to be described as the overview effect by Frank White, a wonderful human being who's, who's friends with Bella Gaia. And I know, um, Dan, I think you know Frank as well. And, um, you know, that, that term was created because so many astronauts have described having this life-changing, consciousness-shifting experience. And one of the things that we do with Bella Gaia you know, and uh, that I think many are working to do through VR and, and amazing space art projects. So we have the power now to simulate the overview effect for people who can't yet go to space physically. By doing that, by pulling people to that perspective and seeing the whole, seeing how we are part of the whole, the whole is a system, a living system that we all have the power to influence and impact um, it changes our relationship with our own planet. So that, that is so much of what I, I, I am so deeply grateful to everyone here for the incredibly important work that you're doing. And I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the work that NASA is doing is helping us to look back at our planet and see what is happening with climate change and give us incredible views and science that are helping us right here on the surface of the Earth. So if we talk about climate, uh, climate change and um, right here surface on the earth, Lisbeth right now is under evacuation orders. Um, and I'm smiling because I've been there so many times and it's so stressful on so many levels. Uh, and we can go down deeper and just think about how fortunate we still are because you're safe, you have internet connection, you have friends you can visit, but then you have next door practically downtown uh, homeless people and maybe more coming up. And how, how do we uh, take the data from space and looking at the clouds and all the climate disruption that's happening and make it palpable to people who are decision makers and who are actually in the leadership position that could make this change. I mean, we if people are aware, but the leadership is not, where are we going to go? So I would like to hear from Lisbeth first because she's right in the thick of it, but then really yeah. take the discussion a little bit in that direction. Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's difficult to say because I feel like there has been, just within science fiction, there have been a, a thousand movies that have shown us why, <laughs> how it's avoidable and why it should be avoided. Um, but it's interesting because from a policy perspective, uh, how do you influence that through policy? <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I'm not sure about the answer to that, actually. Uh, but uh, what I can say is that um, 
space art in general and artwork, uh, a lot of like climate uh, artwork in general has been, um, sometimes when you're imagining the future, it's very dystopian. So there are a, a lot of the artwork that I've seen has been apocalyptic a lot of the time, um, but rarely do you see artwork that is uh, kind of a good future <laughs> and uh, kind of like uh, what future would, do we want to see? And what I've found through uh, development of like the NASA travel posters, for example, that were released a while ago, mm -hmm. um, you can Google them. They're really awesome. They're basically uh, kind of helping us imagine what it would be like to live on exoplanets and uh, planets that are circling other stars. And there's planets where it rains diamonds, uh, which would be really great for a jewelry store, right? <laughs> and there's planets where you would get a really great tan if you're laying on a beach <laughs> on this other planet. And what's interesting to me is um, when we developed those posters, there were uh, educators from all over the world that began using those posters as curriculum almost. So children would be developing their own posters and they're imagining their own life on another world. And it's interesting um, if we did that for Earth, that would be really great too. Um, what are the futures that we're imagining collectively that are good and positive futures and collectively, what do we want to see? I think that sort of artwork and just a, a collective imagining of um, what we want to see would be really great. Lindy, I see you waving. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I couldn't agree more. Oh my goodness. I just want to say really quickly to Elizabeth, those posters that you created with JPL yeah. are some of my favorite space art in the universe. They're amazing <laughs> and so beautiful. Yeah, we should post the link to that uh, after our chat. Absolutely. There were a lot of illustrators involved, but yes, the studio at JPL kind of uh, was the creative team that helped imagine what those might look like. Thank you. <laughs> so, Lindy, give us your thoughts. Yeah, I, I'm really in agreement with all of this. Um, one of the, I think, beauties and also frailties of humans is that, uh, is that we struggle to create the things that we can imagine. And, and one of the problems with both life on earth and life in space has been that it's followed the hero model of civilization where it's only for the few, it's not for you, it's for someone else yes. and it's unattainable for you. Mm -hmm. And also let's just wait for that person who really is a genius to make the change. But what we really need is to understand that especially now all of us actually have to be able to take action. We have to be able to imagine and we have to be able to work together in teams where every voice is heard and where everyone brings something forward. And so this idea that you can wait for someone else to solve the problem is over. And one of the things that space exploration gives us that allows us to move, you know, we have the astronaut, which is kind of the archetype of the hero. But on the other hand, we have something much more beautiful, which is actually Tracy Drain's field of systems engineering. This is a leap in human evolution that uh, is new. It's new, it's just a few decades old. It's the idea that as a group, we can build something so complicated that no single one of us can understand it, and yet it works. And that's what we need to do now as a society. We have to embrace this team model, this systems model, where it's not the hero. It's not the toxic leader or the visionary leader. It's all of us together. And I think that to make that change, we need both the art to show us the way, and we need the education to stop making us passive, but instead always give agency every single year of education, not take it away. Don't train you to sit passively and give information back. Train you to think beyond what you know already. And that's, I believe, really what we need. And the very most inspiring place to do it right now is with space. I love that. I, um, I, uh, that's so exciting and inspiring. I, I, it brings to mind, I was talking to a friend once who's um, close to one of the top film directors in the world. I won't say his name because of what I'm about to say, where apparently this man said, even though he's one of the most successful filmmakers of all time, he still to this day goes on set and he's terrified every morning that he's not going to be able to find the shot. And, you know, and, and that I actually found that kind of really encouraging because for me as a younger filmmaker, you know, it's like, oh, we all have this human experience of fear and limitation. And it's not that this, as much as this filmmaker is an extremely talented person and he's had a very successful life, there's a sense of, you know, he's a human being. And the only thing that differentiates him from others is he was willing to move beyond his fear. And I think that that's so important as part of the education that you're talking about, Lindy, is that people really understand how creativity works from the inside and that creativity is not 
for the select few, creativity is a constitutive feature of our of the human mind and of the human spirit. And um, that that is kind of an essential feature of what makes us who we are. And I, and I think that there are examples in space art, maybe falling a little too much into the trap of the, the hero model, Lindy, but nevertheless, like the, the film Interstellar, you know, written and directed by Christopher Nolan, uh, starring uh, Matthew McConaughey and Jessica Chastain, I, I find very inspiring because that's an example of, uh, I think what they do towards the end of that film where there's a very strange relationship in, in time with that film where it seems like there's communication uh, across time, uh, particularly when McConaughey's character goes into the black hole and he's sort of in like the fifth dimension, which seems to be the physicalization of time. He can move physically back and forward across moments and he can communicate with his former self to give him clues to get to here. And, you know, it's all kind of trippy, but, but I think that's a beautiful metaphor for, you know, what, what is possible for us going back, you know, to your question, Victoria, about, you know, I, I think that shifts in consciousness are required, not just from decision makers, but from everyone. And that's how we're going to change our leadership and demand change, something we're seeing you know, with the protests in the wake of, of the murder of George Floyd and, and others, is that when, when people's consciousness elevates as a group, as a collective, that's when change happens. And I'm reminded of a, just a beautiful interview I heard just in the past few days uh, with Krista Tippett, who has a podcast called On Being with a wonderful uh, Zen Buddhist uh, writer and, and teacher and, and um, social activist. Uh, named Angel Kyoto Williams. And um, she talks a lot. She's one of the leading uh, African Americans in the Zen community. And she talks about, you know, Krista asked her, you know, how do you connect to fearlessness in the face of so much challenge and so much, you know, you could have so much reason for sort of despair? How do you keep going? And she said, well, in the Zen tradition, we have this idea of, you know, the word in Zen is emptiness, but she sort of switches it to the idea of boundlessness. And she says in that, in that space of boundlessness that she just comes back to again and again, if she finds herself caught up in despair or fear, she comes back to a sense of boundlessness. And in that space, there's a possibility, there's a sense that time as we currently understand it in our mind sort of dissolves. And she's connected directly to her ancestors who's she is living proof that the sacrifices of her ancestors have paid off. And similarly, that then connects her imaginatively to, you know, the people for whom she will be an ancestor and that her sacrifices will, will be helping them across time. And that sense of boundlessness helps her um, kind of hold on to a sense of possibility that might not otherwise be available to her. And that allows her to have a, a kind of sense of courage or fearlessness. And so I think that that scene in Interstellar and a lot of space art, you know, can, can connect us to that sense of boundlessness and possibility that can give us a sense of courage and creativity and possibility in the face of what can be, you know, just such a, an avalanche of, of sort of bad news and, and, and terrifying uh, facts that it's, e it's so easy and natural for us to shut down from a fear response. But I think, I think space art can really help us move beyond that. Um, and I think that's sort of really vital right now. And you bring an important that's amazing. point on uh, the idea of time. One of the things I noticed uh, in this time of quarantine is how it's shifting our perception of time. And I hear it from friends, from students, where at once it feels like it's going really slow. And at the same time, I cannot believe it's middle of September. So it just it's it's the whole linear sequence of our constructed time, industrialized type time, is also dissolving, and we're shifting, which means we'll be shifting our relationship to space, which we already are. If you think of our little spots here, and that we're coming from different parts of of this planet, talking to each other. So uh, maybe some thoughts around that, because space, again, is another place where there is no time as we know it. There is no gravity as we know it. There, it's a completely different idea of existence. And there is no empty space. It's no such thing. That, that is just 
our limitation to think about it that way. So the idea of boundless space, I love. I think that's a wonderful way to describe it. And to allow people to sense that even if they're quarantined or under a lot of pressure is so important. So it really is about how to bring in mindfulness and this kind of chaos. And maybe some of you have some thoughts on this. I, I have thoughts on, I want to touch on a couple of things that you have all said, because this conversation is so rich. And um, first, just on, on fear for a moment, you know, I think one of the most powerful things that we are being invited to embrace here is, is the unknown, which, of course, our lives have been cast into even more unknown than ever. And I think exploration of space and the creation of space art and the collective exploration of these ideas together inspires us to embrace the unknown, to champion curiosity, wonder, exploration, and inquiry, deep inquiry over fear. Um, you know, fear is a natural part of our lives and it's totally legitimate to be terrified at moments right now, not to downplay that. Um, but there are ways that we can use that to drive and motivate the creation of new worlds. So, um, you know, going back to also the, the notion that the hero's journey model is really kind of falling apart now. Um, I just want to give a, a shout out to this amazing work of, of this man named Jeff Gomez, who created a new model called the collective journey model. And he has this, this whole blog that's just online, you know, available to anyone to, to check out. He works in transmedia storytelling with Starlight Runner Entertainment, and they created the story Bible of Avatar and a lot of other you know, movies that many people um, have seen and, and are familiar with how powerful these stories are. But so I really agree that the, the hero's journey model is, is something that we are moving past and beyond and we need to because it's not up to one person to be the savior. It's up to all of us to work together. And we have new, so, you know, we're hardwired to respond to storytelling. So, you know, that's one of the things that's so powerful about science fiction, about the stories that come about when people understand what goes into a space mission. You know, all of these things come back to telling our stories collectively. And we have new models for storytelling that are so powerful now that are helping to drive global movements. So, um, you know, I, the one other thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, we have this notion that these are experiences that ha have been, you know, restricted to an elite group of people. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important that we take this experience of the overview effect and experiences of, of going and traveling to space. Now we can do this through technology and virtual reality. We have our, our virtual reality experience for Bella Gaia is available for free online if anyone wants to go and download it you know, to their own headset. Um, and really, it, we're really dedicated to making this democratically available to all. By making these experiences democratically available to everyone, we are empowering every human being and every human being has a unique perspective and voice and the power to create change in this world. And that change, as you were saying, Dan, has ripple effects for generations. So I think, you know, we have this amazing ability to, through all of these things that we're talking about, to help people understand that we are working with ideas that are extremely timely and relevant and extremely important to tackle and work together on right now. And they're also timeless in a sense. These are, are some of the biggest questions we've been examining since the beginning of, of humanity. What's our place in the universe? You know, do we have the power to create change? I say unquestionably we do, and we, we need to all work together and we, we all need to be heroes of this story. Victoria, you're muted. I yeah. know. Classic <laughs> Zoom moment. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to ask Lindy if she has any ideas for um, working with inviting the audiences into a kind of a sharing educational 
environment where uh, we can hear what audiences that sometimes don't have a voice can share with us. It's so important. And we were talking about that as a panel ahead of time, um, yeah. talking about Victoria's idea that perhaps we could make this more of an ongoing conversation because I do think that getting all the voices heard is really important. Um, there are so many ways to do it. Uh, of course, we can share our art. We can do many of the things that we've already been doing, but I think that we need to think about things that have more directed outcomes. Um, one of the things we've been doing that might be interesting to experiment with is um, collecting the most important questions to answer choosing those that most of us agree upon and then forming virtual teams to think about what we can do moving forward. Um, someone said something to me recently that I thought was uh, really profound and I share it because I think it pulls together all of our concerns here on this panel and more broadly about, about um, society, climate change, our ability to create uh, a better future. Uh, he said to me, um, you know, there is no plan B. He said, it doesn't matter what we do to the earth, it will always be more habitable than Mars or any other planet that's within our reach, uh, including things like, forgive me, you know, total nuclear war, we will still be more habitable on the earth than we are on, on Mars. Wow. And so let's figure out how to work together to create change. I really think that we can. And I think that empowering every voice, crowdsourcing solutions, giving people that sense of strength, uh, let's together as a panel and as an audience start creating these virtual teams, knowing how we know something, uh, moving forward uh, towards solutions that, that are more equitable and more sustainable. And so uh, basing on that comment, how would you answer the question that many have? Why are we going to Mars when <laughs> is going on? I have a tiny answer. I'd love to hear what other people say. I think, first of all, because we can't avoid it, that humans have exploration baked into our genetic matter and we are going, whether any one of us wants us to or not. And then the second reason that we explore is to inspire every person here on Earth to do more. If we can create these robots that go places where humans can't go and tell us about them, then we absolutely can come together in the ways we've been discussing as a panel so far and solve our problems here. We can overcome that fear and guilt narrative that we're all crushed with right now and make a narrative about a positive, optimistic future. I just love, I love that so much, Lindy. And I, you know, I'm, I'm reminded now of the moment earlier in the pandemic when, you know, there was the SpaceX, SpaceX launch um, to the International Space Station. I just remember tuning into that and just being so moved and inspired and just crying. And, you know, it was such an extraordinary, it was such a crazy kind of, uh, I'm trying to find the not swear word for this. It really messed with my head. That's, that, let, let's put it that way. Because here we were in the midst of this pandemic where there was so much collective suffering and also disproportionate suffering on the part of black and brown and native Americans and, um, and, and also this, country, you know, suffering disproportionately from from other wealthy nations that had different, uh, you know, styles of leadership. And so, you know, it was just this very, very messed up time. And at the same time, you know, there was this and, and then, you know, also people refusing to wear masks and, and just this kind of challenge that I had to really understand, you know, that point of view and and just the the inability to kind of really get for some people this deep interdependence that we have, you know, mm -hmm. where, you know, my Zen teacher said to me, or said to really our, our whole community once early in the pandemic, wearing a mask and washing your hands are profound acts of compassion right now. Mm -hmm. You know, that's yes. what I do in my own kitchen or just walking out the door wearing this little piece of fabric affects everybody around me. And and because everybody's interconnected with everybody else and the, the biology, the, this virus is revealing that to us in such a powerful way, um, you know, what I do really matters and what I don't do really matters. And, and so, um, you know, there was something just so profoundly inspiring at that time of, of you know, in this continued time of continued suffering uh, of, you know, what, what we are capable of and, something, you know, very, very, and again, I think it goes back to this notion that I was referencing earlier, this kind of sense of boundlessness. And, and in Zen, we do talk about that. You know, we say, yes, we're sort of individual 
human beings with our own separate bodies and, and stories and, and identities and bank accounts. And also, you know, that's just features of us. And there's something deeper. There's something that transcends all of that. And in Zen, we talk about it as emptiness or Buddha nature or something else. But it's like, what is that? And, and I think that starts to get revealed um, in these moments of sort of collective awakening. And I think there's something about space exploration that, that really helps us wake up to that. It's, you know, we talk in Zen about waking up, you know, and so what are we waking up to? There's something already there. There's something about who and what we are that goes well beyond, you know, Lindy, the fear and the guilt, you know, and the grasping and the shame and all of these aspects of our ego that sort of um, are these misidentifications with separateness. And exactly. there's something about, I think, space exploration and space art that, that helps us connect to that awareness more deeply. And you can access that in other ways by, you know, doing meditation and prayer and other things. But this is a way, you know, to, to really reveal something to all of us about, about ourselves and the truth, the actual truth about ourselves that transcends a lot of illusions. Mm -hmm. It erases the illusory. I, that's actually, I think, what's necessary right now for us yeah. to um, tackle the crises in front of us. Exactly. It erases the illusory notion of separation, the false century, sense of boundaries that, you know, that Victoria's amazing alien stardust project is working to help okay. people to realize as well, you know, that boundaries are illusions that we've created. You know, uh, stardust and space dust and all of the, the particles floating around the world that are affecting people's air quality right now. They don't know the boundaries that we've drawn on these maps. And what we work to do by helping people to see the overview effect and see how interconnected and interdependent we are is now something that through the pandemic, people have understood unquestionably that the way that we take care of our most vulnerable populations or do not affects everyone else on the planet and that we have to care for each other, that what, what affects one affects all. And that I think is really at the heart shifting that, that base understanding and perception, the notion of separation is, is at the heart of you know, so many of our social and ecological problems. And when we realize that we're really all connected and interdependent, we can, you know, we activate empathy, which I believe everyone has the capacity for. Some leaders have made me question that. I'll be honest. It's, it's like, I believe that everyone has the capacity for empathy. And we have the power through space art and space exploration to activate this sense of empathy, which, you know, by activating the right and left brain at the same time, neuroscience scientists have found actually that people are able to learn more and, and differently. So I find that really fascinating and a powerful opportunity for collective learning and growth as well as individual growth. Mm -hmm. And I did want to mention also to add on to that, um, there is this really wonderful technology transfer that happens when new things and new technologies are developed for space, where um, even now uh, the cell phone in your camera, uh, the camera in your cell phone, excuse me, <laughs> um, was actually like first miniaturized for a spacecraft. Um, and so there's always, if anything is sent to Mars or any new technology is developed, it might even come back down. And so there's this new um, it kind of, that also inspires science fiction, science fiction in some ways. Um, and there's a loop that happens where, you know, uh, movie directors like Dan are inspired by this awesome technology. And then the technology is then created, um, you know, because engineers are then inspired by this movie <laughs> that was released in some ways. And so there's just a really wonderful um, collective loop that just kind of is circling all the time and kind of pushing the edges of what's possible in some ways. Uh, and I think that's really beautiful. Uh, thing. And even fear can drive this. So uh, the internet was developed out of fear of atomic war and, you know, Russia somehow taking all our information in case of war or that it all gets destroyed. Um, and some of the scientists who developed it among who is Leonard Kleinrock, right, at UCLA, 
were saying that they never in a million years thought it would be human to human communication. They imagined it as peer to peer computer com communication. And so to see it evolve as it did from fear is actually pretty amazing how these technologies can be repurposed. And uh, a lot of AI technologies are developed for the wrong reason, but they can also be repurposed and it's not all negatives. It's really, how do we teach, especially the youth to be so comfortable with new technologies and rocket science and ways of actually hands-on thinking so that these technologies can be repurposed. I think also there's uh, um, people, I think, you know, it, it makes sense that people say, you know, in the face of so much suffering on earth, how can we be sending these very expensive rockets, you know, be, you know, out, out uh, beyond our planet. And at the same time, I don't think people necessarily appreciate how much knowledge and science <laughs> these missions are doing that help us back here on earth. And I'm sure, you know, Lindy and Lizbeth, you could speak to them with much greater knowledge than, than I have. I, I'm, I'm just struck by, um, reminded of a wonderful memoir by Catherine Sullivan, who uh, was one of the first women astronauts in the same class as Sally Ride, and who went on to become the head of NOAA, um, you know, and so playing a very important role. Uh, she was the head of NOAA in, uh, for the entire Obama administration. Really extraordinary person. And she was um, part of the team that uh, launched Hubble into space. and. The mem her memoir, which I believe is called Hands on Hubble, um, you know, talks a lot about the, the really the, the um, kind of minute amount of detailed work and preparation and innovation that went into training for and designing that mission that took place over, I believe, something like close to five years. And there was an enormous amount of, of work that they had to do, you know, as a team with their engineers and scientists to get to make that mission possible. And then when you think about, and this goes back to our theme of space art, when you think about something like the Hubble telescope and what that has meant for us, not just in our science and astronomy, but, but the power of images to inspire and the, the, the sense of awe and wonder that we get. I mean, sometimes I like to go and sort of download very, very high res images from Hubble and you know, you can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. And there's still billions of stars in that little part of your screen. And there's something so extraordinary about that. And I think on the one hand, you know, I think if one isn't skillful or mindful, it's easy to say, oh, we're so tiny, we don't matter at all. What does anything matter? But, but I don't think that's the right attitude or the right um, takeaway. I think that there's a sense that this universe is far greater than we could ever comprehend. And, and we are part of it. And so far, we are the only life that we are aware of. And that means we are precious. There's, there is something special about us. Uh, the fact that we're conscious and creating and making things and exploring. So far, we are the only beings that we are aware of in this extremely vast universe that do any such thing. You know, uh, and, it, you know, and I think that means we should really be um, really prizing ourselves and taking care of ourselves and our planet. The only one we've got, uh, as you say, Lindy, the only real habitable place in the universe. Um, and I think when one starts to really explore in research and in space art and talking to astronauts and scientists and engineers, just how hard it is to survive in space, like when you actually appreciate why it takes billions of dollars to send, uh, you know, rockets out, out, out of our, uh, off our planet, you start to really understand just how lethal it is out there and, and actually just how precious our planet is in being a home for, in making a home for us where we can survive. So I think the power of image and the power of story becomes you know, become really central to to uh, raising our consciousness at, at this time. And it is really important to think not of ourself as humans as kind of the center of the universe of consciousness, but that everything that shares this earth from plankton to whales to lions to trees and 
fungi are all part of our consciousness. And part of the problem is that we're thinking, oh, we're so smart, we can build these engines and rockets and send them to space as if it's separate from this. And it's not. It's a, it's a really a very intricate ecology that we are part of. So to talk about that a little bit, I think would be important as well. well Sylvia Earle, one of the other heads of NOAA, incredible woman who's deeply inspired me. We had a, an opportunity to collaborate with Sylvia um, in California at one point. And as she says, no, no blue, no green. So our oceans, we really need to take care of our oceans and inspire people to have a deeper understanding of what is happening with our oceans and how we're affecting our oceans. And the amazing work that, that NASA is doing is helping us to understand that as, as well. You know, there are a lot of people that are like Ron Garin, who are both astronauts and aquanauts. And um, so, you know, and it's incredible. It's, I, I believe we know even less about what's in our oceans than we know about what is in space that is near to our planet at this point. Um, so, I, yeah, I really appreciate you bringing that up, uh, Victoria. And, you know, it just, I, I, could, I can't, be happy enough that that we're all discussing this and and encouraging other people to also to have these conversations and to to start an ongoing discussion and hone in on on the things that we can work on together um, because that that is really the key. Could, could I possibly ask Elizabeth a question? Is that, I'm like stepping out of my proper role? No, that's <laughs> terrible, actually. And, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that that happens as we close our yeah. session where we talk to each other and then continue the conversation, please. Elizabeth, I'm so interested to know that it, you as an artist and a creator of our um, possible future, many of, I suppose, several, many of our possible futures, and working there really close by with the engineers who are building the missions. I'm wondering what moments of epiphany you can recall or share with us or moments where you really had a flash of a different vision of human futures um, or what it means to explore in space. I feel like you're right at that active cusp every day. I would love to hear if you had any moments. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, so I am definitely there at JPL, uh, kind of where the magic is happening. And um, so what was really great about uh, kind of, so a part of my work is mission formulation. So I am kind of, uh, so you were mentioning Europa, uh, when we were kind of first imagining the Europa lander, that was going to be, I'm not sure if that is still happening or not, but I was in the pre mission formulation stage for that uh, specific uh, part of the mission. And what's really great is that um, even when uh, it's a small team called A Team, where um, it's like kind of like the Avengers of JPL kind of get together to kind <laughs> of design uh, space missions when we are imagining <laughs> when we wrote where we will go, like to Mars, it's to good. Jupiter. And what happens is it's called kind of the napkin sketch stage, where really it is sketching. And so I'm kind of in the room. Um, helping to sketch and draw and visualize uh, what a lot of these futures might look like and for different missions, uh, possible missions, things we may not see in 10 years, you know, how long it takes. <laughs> and so what's really wonderful there is kind of um, seeing all of the wild ideas that engineers and scientists can come up with. And of course, they're often downscaled, right, <laughs> a lot of the time. But what's really wonderful is um, uh, just questions like, uh, so I'll be in the room asking questions that they might not be asked. So things like, what would it be like to live on this world if we could? What would you like to do um, if you were there? and like physically there. <laughs> and, you know, you get answers like ice skating sometimes. Uh, you get uh, answers that you might not expect. Uh, it's always good answers, right? <laughs> so good, positive things. And so um, that's kind of uh, one of the wonderful things is just all of the ideas that scientists have uh, about going to these places. Like, um, for example, for Titan, um, for uh, Titan, uh, one of the moons, uh, you might be able to, to hand glide for a very long time <laughs> if you were on Titan because the atmosphere is just, it allows you to stay up in the air longer. And those things I think are just the coolest um, 
things to imagine and just talk to the scientist about. So uh, yeah, and uh, you know, those things, of course, what I will say is uh, it'd be great to think about those things for Earth as well. <laughs> like, uh, cause we can do those things here too. So hopefully that answers. And especially question. thinking of Earth related to everything as opposed to a separate planet from all, I think is a really important thing. And if we put ourselves in context of Ars Electronica, it's in Kepler's gardens. So we actually are calling on Kepler and, and at the same time we're separated into our gardens all over the world. Some gardens are actual, others are artificial. Uh, we were actually locked out of our botanical garden because of COVID. And even if you wanted to go there now, you couldn't because of the air. So that reality is just constantly present. And um, the reality of time is also present. We're, of course, running out of time. As I warned you, we can keep going and we just scratch the surface. So I really do hope this is a seed for something much nicer and bigger, including, inclusive of others. Um, and we will try that for sure. Um, if everyone can close with a short uh, closing statement, that would be wonderful. How about Lindy starting off? I'm really grateful to have taken part of this and want to thank Tracy for being someone who was so interdisciplinary uh, in her thinking and hope that all of us will find ways to include more people in our adventures going forward toward an optimistic future. Thank you. Thank you for joining. It's so much pleasure to meet you and for your good work. Rhiannon. Uh, I want to express my deep, deep gratitude as well to Tracy, to you, Victoria, um, to this incredible group, all my fellow panelists for doing the amazing and important work that you're doing. I'm so glad to meet you all and start this discussion. I hope that people will come to Alien Stardust on the 13th at 12 Eastern, where I'll be singing with Victoria. And you know, she's created this incredible experience. It's really designed to give people tools to, you know, as an artist, I, I think a lot about taking people to other places and what what we're bringing back with us. And we're trying to send you out to other worlds and, and allow you to come back with new tools to cope with what we're all dealing with on the planet right now. So yeah, what, what we do matters and echoes throughout generations after us. We are all catalysts and all agents of change. And I thank you all. And thank you for your presence, Raina, catalyst. <laughs> <laughs> You have a list in your name and you're fulfilling your purpose. Thank you. I got to live up to that, right? Oh, there you go. <laughs> and Elizabeth. Yeah, so uh, first I want to say thank you to everyone here and Tracy, of course, who will mm -hmm. hopefully be watching this later. <laughs> and um, yeah, and definitely just, I just want to mention, of course, uh, places like NASA right now need everyone. Um, for me, uh, not just of educational backgrounds, but um, cultural backgrounds. Uh, my family is Mexican American. And so um, I've been trying to, uh, you know, uh, reach out to a lot of the uh, Latin American community as well. Uh, but uh, backgrounds of um, th that, it's all important. So thank you. Thank you for being there. Really much appreciated. And then last but not least. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Victoria. And thank, to, thank you to all my fellow panelists. Thank you to Tracy. And thanks to all those who are joining us. It's, it's a little strange to, um, you know, just be speaking amongst ourselves and, and not to be able to see the faces of those who are watching us. So I think very much in the spirit of what we've been discussing, I for one would would love to, you know, receive the feedback of those who've been participating and to hear, you know, your views, your ideas, how um, our discussion struck you or what it what resonated with you or what it what it uh, inspired in you and just just to really start a, a dialogue so that we can connect with you and and feel a sense of um of your presence and a, and a kinship with you because you know i think everybody in this festival um, whether you're speaking on a panel or whether you're you're listening to a panel i sense that we really are you know fellow travelers and and that is something that i think we really need right now um 
and because not everybody <laughs> shares, you know, not everybody has woken up to the degree that we have yet. I think eventually everybody arrives on time, but you know, while we're all trying to, to get somewhere, um, you know, it'd be, it would be great to connect and, and to hear from you and, and to, and to um, listen and, and learn from you. So thank you all. Thank you for saying that because it really is about uh, also future audiences. Uh, there's a lot of time zones now because of the different locations, different people, different platforms this is streaming on. So we really truly have no idea who's watching and how long and when. Uh, so hopefully this recording lives on and is a seed for something wonderful to happen and uh, may the forest be with us. Give me your hands. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you all so much. Bye. Thank you.